Oh, it's been a, a break since we had our last um, training course. And I'm really hoping in that time you got to practice uh, some of what we did last time, which I think the lesson we had last time was probably one of the most exciting lessons that I did when I learned photography. It was one of the most amazing things that I learned was about the fact that we intrinsically uh, understand patterns within nature and we see that as being aesthetically attractive and when images mimic what nature does we find those images have a narrative and are attractive so i really recommend that you take on board what we did last time and and review it uh, the videos are on the website and you have the link to those but I'm just going to do a very quick review so far because we're going to be talking about more of these things uh, within today's lesson. We started off the beginning of this series talking about what made an engaging image and timing is something in photography that's very important. But what makes something aesthetically pleasing and has an emotive narrative is what tugs at our heartstrings and makes us um, connect intellectually to an image. And what we're going to be doing today is going to have a look at some of those elements that not only make it aesthetically pleasing, but have an emotive reaction, which we're often unaware of, but we know we like the image because of it. So um, what we explored initially when we were looking at image design was ensuring that we framed the image up appropriately and only included the elements that were in the story but also that we uh, made a decision a conscious decision about whether we uh, did a landscape layout a portrait layout and also whether we uh, took the image from above below straight on and realized that all of those decisions impacted the aesthetics in the image and also had an emotional response. Last week, we talked about um, the Fibonacci numbers and how patterns, they, the Fibonacci numbers represent the patterns that we find naturally in nature. And we intrinsically understand nature to be beautiful. And because of that, whenever we see something that mimics nature, we immediately find it engaging. And we talked about the golden spiral. And if you can place parts of your image on any of those points in the golden spiral, the key parts that you want people to have a look at, you'll find a lot more attractive image. And when we combine those um, golden spirals for each of the different corners within our image, we end up with our approximation which is a rule of thirds and I strongly encourage you to put that grid up in your camera uh, viewfinder to ensure that uh, when you're trying to line something up the rule of thirds is not something that you use all the time it's not necessarily a rule it's a guide but it does tend to make better photographs when you put your key points on either of those four intersections or if you've got strong horizontal or vertical lines, if you actually put them on the thirds. And that includes your horizon. Put your horizon on the bottom third or the top third. It's rare that a horizon works in the middle. It does sometimes if you've got a square frame, but most of the time it works better on the rule of thirds. So that's what we did um, in the last, I think, five lessons. And what we're going to do now is when you're looking at a scene trying to determine what aspects of that scene can you optimize and what parts of it will actually speak emotionally to the viewer and optimize the narrative because remember we said that narrative and aesthetics were two key components to making an engaging image and these are the things that um, participate in communicating that narrative to the the viewer and so today we're just going to explore lines and uh, a lot of you are quite aware of leading lines and in your photography have explored that but there's all sorts of lines and so we're going to have a look at lines and, and their point and direction 
So typically lines connect two points and they may not necessarily be a, a physical line. They can be um, a, a, well, a physical line, something like a vertical pole or a horizon or a bridge. They can also be implied so that if you've got three people each looking at something, then there's eye lines there that that is the lines that we're talking about. And then there's the leading lines that actually guide the viewer's eye somewhere. They are typically though a, a predominant feature in the image, even if they're um, implied, they're very much part of the narrative. And this is where in an image, we can have a beautiful image of a subject and the subject is beautiful, but we need extra information in there to actually communicate something that's emotive, to tug at people's heartstrings. And if we can try and incorporate some of these lines, we can then um, add extra, uh, um, get extra bang for our buck, I guess, in, in terms of our image. The lines can have different functions and, and more, you can have different types of lines and you can have more than one function at a time for one line, but each one of them can um, communicate something. So, for example, if you do have a gentle curve, um, it, we're going to talk about curves and, and what curve lines communicate to the viewer, but they also act as leading lines at the same time. And the emotional response that lines trigger depend very much on the type of line that we have. So um, whilst vertical and horizontal lines imply stability, lines can um, be implications of movement and we have often seen those within car racing and that where they follow the car and you can see the strips behind it and those lines communicate to the viewer that there is movement. So we're going to go through each of these different types of lines and just have a look at how they uh, communicate a feeling to the person looking at it. And this isn't magic. This isn't, oh, they've psychologically, you know, worked this out. This is really from experience. Everybody experiences things that are, you know, tall, like a tall building. And you, in your brain, associate that with strength and power. And so when you see an image that has something long and tall in it, your brain makes that connection and, and says dignity and power. And it's an emotional layer that you add onto that image. And as humans, we, um, we look at horizontal lines and we know that when something rests horizontally, it's got little chance of falling over. And so it gives us a feeling of safety and stability if we know that, that it's straight. Uh, diagonal lines we know are typically dangerous like ladders or anything sloping. And so we do have a feeling of danger and movement, that it's a dynamic image. So by imp uh, um, including these lines within our images, we add a communication layer in there to the user or the, the viewer that's actually looking at them. And that just adds an extra wow to the image. So these are just examples of strong vertical lines that give dignity and power. And you can see they add to the aesthetics and there's lots of things in, in each of these images that additionally add to the aesthetics, which we'll be having a look at later. So things like rhythm and, and tone and um, harmonious color, but those strong vertical lines are the strongest part of this image. Now, I mentioned that horizontal lines imply rest and that's what, when we're looking at the horizon, it's typically a, a moment when we're calm and rested. And we just see that as not having energy in it. It's just a calm, restful, emotional response. And so if you are looking at an image that you want to put in one of your uh, rooms that you typically rest in, you don't tend to put something that's very dynamic. You put something that's restful. And so things with a 
horizon line with strong horizontals in it imply restfulness. We know that the vertical is strong and, and powerful and we know that horizontal is restful. Well, diagonal is normally always dangerous. <laughs> when you know when every, anything's at an angle, um, it has the potential to move. And so it adds a dynamic to an image. And it's something that I often do after I've taken a horizontal landscape image and vertical image, the traditional way of looking at something, I'll just mix it up and throw in something that's, you know, put it at an angle, run it through the corners and give it a, a dynamic. And I did that recently. We were down at um, Port Arlington and they've got a beautiful pier down there that uh, at sunset, they actually light the pier and you can see through the pier all of the Aboriginal paintings. And it looked rather boring just as a horizontal and very, um, like plain and, and calm and peaceful, but I just love the colors in it. So I want to make it more dynamic. And the best way to do that is to put it on a, a diagonal. And it, it's just an extra layer of interest that you can add to your images by making sure there's strong diagonal lines in them that provide energy. And so even in, in these two, you know, a leaf on a branch is usually something that's fairly stable, but by taking advantage of that diagonal, you can put an energy into the image that it otherwise wouldn't have. You can also have jagged lines and jagged lines are similar to diagonal in that they have a um, an energy associated with them, but they, you know, even more so, it just takes it to the next level of having things that aren't regular, just puts a little bit more energy into the image. And it, if you're out looking for things to photograph, see if you can see things naturally in the landscape that are, um, have each of these types of characteristics in them and just take a photo of them. And, it, you know, each, like this is a garage door to a car park. In itself, it's a fairly boring, boring image, but all of those lines and the chaos of those lines give that image energy and yet it's just a car park door. So when you're out with your camera, try and think about lines and how they will add to your image. Curved lines, just in nature, things that are curved are tend, tend to be uh, gentle and soft. So things like waves that are coming into the shoreline are, are gentle and curved, um, rolling hills, clouds, big fluffy clouds, and they give us a feeling of calmness and of um, peace. So if you are trying to communicate that with whatever you're photographing, then try and optimize the, the curves. And they're often seen as being erotic as well. And we can see that um, when we talk about someone being curvaceous, that it, there, there's a level of um, emotion attached with that. So these are, are things like rolling hills and, and just natural curves in nature. And because nature has a lot of curves in it, we associate that with, with beauty and aesthetics. And just fluid, fluidity. And our eye, as soon as we have curves, our eye will run around those curves in the image. And the longer that you can hold someone's attraction to an image, the more emotionally engaged they are in it. So curves are a great uh, tool to use to do that. The other common thing that we have is a combination of some of these lines. We can have uh, combinations of strong verticals and strong horizontals, and they really give us stability. And when you're photog photographing architecture, architecture has a very solid sort of feel to a architectural image. Unless you put it on a diagonal, as soon as you put an architectural image on a diagonal, it then puts an energy, a dy dynamic energy into it because it implies movement. So again, try and um, optimize scenarios for stability 
where you've got strong verticals and strong horizontals. You can have um, eye lines. I haven't got many because I don't take many people to <laughs> photographs, as you know. But um, it, in the top right hand one there where we have um, my granddaughter looking at me, you can see that's the first thing that the viewer looks at is that eye line. So some of these lines can be implied. Um, even between the horse and the lady down below, that was the one once we took at U3A, where you go to the horse's eye, her eye, back to the horse's eye, and you bounce between that line. So when you are photographing um, a group of people or a group of objects, think about the lines and the connections they actually make. So in both of these, there's connections of the objects so the connections between the trees, the tussocks of grass, the weeds in the pond, each one of those things is actually making a line, as is this row of trees on Lake Wanaka in New Zealand. The trees make a line, but it's really a series of elements. So rather than chop one of them off, when you're framing up and you've got a series of elements, think about how you can use that series of elements to actually uh, create a line within your image that will allow the user's eye to follow that line and find a rhythm in the image and come back to the beginning and go back again. So we use these lines as a way of guiding the viewer's eye around the image, but also by um, engaging them in the image. So here we've got the balls of wool, create a line. Um, the different uh, garments, create lines. Uh, in here, we've got the trees creating. The lines in this image are what the image is about. It's not about trees. It's about the shapes and the um, angles of those lines. Lines can also imply movement, as I mentioned before, with the um, car racing example. And so in this image, it's all about the lines. And this is one of those intentional camera movement images. And I really encourage you to explore that capability of moving your camera and getting lines to add to the image. And typically the first thing people learn about lines is about leading lines and how lines within an image will lead the viewer's eye right through the image and allow them to explore it and if you have got lines with your in your image try and have them intersect with the corners diagonally or alternatively start at the rule of thirds as they're coming in so it's again that's about when you're framing up and now you've got these lines you want to utilize them to guide the viewer's eye well then you need to start to think about where you're actually going to position them and we can see in the bottom left one, I've used the corners to position the lines, and then that has allowed the viewer to go dive into the image and all of the lights point down to where that woman's walking in. And the other one with the sunset is, is all pointing towards those people. So um, I hope in your, uh, workshop next week when we, we're going into the city that you can think about lines and how you can use them to create each one of those emotions and also when you are including them within your image be very cognizant of the rule of thirds and your frame because they have to appropriately hit the edges of the frame at the correct spot and also the subject that they're leading to, if you're using leading lines, needs to be positioned um, at somewhere that's aesthetically pleasing, either right in the middle, if you're doing leading lines like a pier, or alternatively, um, the lines will actually lead to that. So I've got that um, sheet of homework for you to think about. Um, but I, the other thing is, shoot some verticals, shoot some horizontals when you're shooting the buildings in the city, but try some diagonals and just see how it makes the image so much more engaging and intriguing because people often don't see buildings in, in diagonals. Okay, well, thanks and um, 
we'll move on to the next session.